Welcome to the podcast, Mike. How are you? I'm doing great. What a privilege to have you on. Um, followed your career. Uh, celebrate what you do by measuring long jumps wherever I get a chance. Triple jumps, long jumps. There's such a tangible thing to, to be able to measure and it always conjures up a, a response from people who's just like, that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so can I, can I ask you straight off the bat, um, what can you remember the jump? Can you remember that world record jump? Oh, like it was yesterday. Thirty years ago, thirty years ago this year. So you remember it like it was yesterday. So is that vivid? Was it? Yeah, well, you know the thing is, it was it was a turning point in my life. And um, for the first couple of years, I probably watched the video every day. <laughs> um, <laughs> But then, um, but since then, you know, um, I don't think about it so much, but other people ask me about it. So I have to revisit it. And um, as time has gone on, I've, I've gotten to look at it in um, a, a, a little bit different of a way, you know? So every time that I do uh, an interview, I try to describe it a little bit differently. You know, so um, so it's still it's still kind of new, you know, to me. But every because every time I watch it, I get goosebumps. Well, that's that's was- amazing to hear. You you um you can appreciate it that much. Did, so when you were watching it back every every day for a couple of years, was that you trying to understand it, to replicate it, or to revisit the moment? Uh, um, all the above. <laughs> right. Part of it, the fact I was trying to look at it technically to see what I was doing, and I found many faults in it. Because um, people said it was a perfect jump, I said no, it wasn't. It was just I had I had a good takeoff and had a lot of speed into it, but um, my landing wasn't um, the way I wanted it to be, and um, also um, my steps weren't quite on. So I had to chop my steps some, so I lost a little bit of momentum also. But um, and then also it's just it's I mean, how many people can can have one of their greatest moments of their lives uh, captured on 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 video and get a chance to look at it whenever they want to? Yeah. Yeah. So it's pretty cool. So you've got some emotional recap there. You've got the technical side as well. So can we get into the technical detail before we get into the sort of the actual performance feel um what what was good about it obviously the distance but what what have you understood since right. that, that has meant that 895 versus say eight eight and a half meters which which would have been ballpark for most of your performances up to that point or you'd hit 870 860 that sort of range but what was the difference uh, well, the difference was that, um, well, for one, I had jumped past the world record on foul jumps about two or three times prior to breaking the world record. So I already knew in my head that I've already done it. I just wasn't able to say I did it because it was, it was a foul. But if you jump as a foul, you still jump the distance. You know, so in my mind, I already did it. It just had mattered to make it official. Um, on that particular jump, uh, technically, what happened is that you know the the approach is 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 all about rhythm, and and, and it's about um, dispersing your your speed throughout the approach, so that you're not expending too much energy in the beginning, but the the the, pri- the proper amount driving out the back, so that by the time you hit the board. You're hitting the board at the at the optimal speed with the optimal amount of effort. Because if you put too much effort into it, then you lose you lose at, at the takeoff. And if you don't get enough speed enough speed going, then you have no speed taken to the air. So the rhythm was 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 dead on, and the track was really really it was a hard surface, which was really bold well for me because I was able to really use my jumping ability to to spring off the track. And um, 
And then, um, you know, I just was able to really just get into a good position at takeoff. And, um, you know, my, my, and also just my focus was incredible. I've never been able to focus like that before. Um, like the clarity that I had and what I had to do at that moment. Like people asked me when I know I was going to break the record. I said, as soon as I stood on the runway, when I started going through my visualization, I was like, oh, this is it. Get going. <laughs> oh, wow. So, I felt it. Let, let me pick up on that in a moment, Ben, because you, you mentioned a couple of things there. So, so I, I remember watching the competition. It, I mean, whole, all of Tokyo World Championships was just was incredible anyway. Um, but that competition was so hot. And watching it back just in preparation of, of talking to you and and seeing the difference between the jump, the world record jump, and I think one that you'd registered eight and a half meters, something like that, where your shoulders were up. You didn't have that same level of flow. Um, But, but there was, (laughs) there was an amazing moment where you, you launched one, didn't you? And it was a foul. And so you knew that you were jumping well, but it just hadn't quite, you just, you just nicked the plasticine, hadn't you? Right. And the thing is that was typical for me. Um, Carl was a, a perfectionist in what he did. So when he jumped, he rarely fouled. The, he had one foul there at the competition. That was unlike him. But unlike like myself, that was a problem throughout my career was fouling. Um, matter of fact, my, my friend Lee Banks, Banks nicknamed me Mike Foul. You know? <laughs> so I, I left a lot of my best jumps out there. You know, so... Um, yeah, because you, you, you're really animated. I remember you were kneeling down looking at the plasticine and you were, you were sort of gesticulating with the officials and saying, oh, no, it's hardly anything. That wasn't me. And um, how, how are you able to, to be so animated and in the moment as well as then, as you talked about, really focusing down? Right. Well, you know, what happened on that foul jump... Um, when I, I didn't, most time when you foul, you can feel it. Okay. You know, it didn't feel, and then it didn't feel like a foul. And then when I went back to look at the, I said, let me see the mark. You know, there's a, there's a plasticine like clay type surface where it'll leave an indention in there of your shoe. And the indention that they showed me was from an, an Adidas spike. And I was wearing Nikes. Okay. And I was like, that's not mine. That's not my, that's not my mark right there. I'm wearing Nike. That's Adidas. You know, so they missed it. And the thing is, on the video, they had showed that people were like, oh, yeah, it was barely a foul. But I was like, no, the video they showed showed it from the top. The angle of the plasticine was facing that way. So my right. foot, like, here, but it wasn't touching the plasticine. So that the jump was actually fair, and they 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 miscalled that one, you know. But um, you know, for me, I'm, I I view myself like an entertainer, you know, almost more so than an athlete. So I was very comfortable in front of sixty thousand, eighty thousand people, just being myself. And I, you know, I'm I, I wear my heart on my sleeve. So whatever emotions I have, you're gonna see them. Yeah, it, it does. You do strike me as someone who loves the theater of it. Um, the moment that the distance was announced, um, you did it almost like an unintended 200 meters. Um, <laughs> it, was a, it was a bit like Usain Bolt running around the bend after the 2008 100 meter final. Um, it just had that spirit of, of just uh, personal success and wonder but also was that heightened by the by the rivalry yeah carl and i um i in my mind at least you know there was a big rivalry and him he had somebody who was pushing him in me but for me he was my he was the arch enemy he was my arch rival he was the nemesis he was the person i had to speak he was the person that i just despised i i i i I mean carl's an okay guy you know, but I didn't allow myself to befriend him. I, I demonize him because I know that for me, I compete. I compete better when I'm when I'm angry, when I feel when I feel slighted, 
And I've always, I was always like the underdog, like pretty much throughout my, like my life, I felt that way. I was like a little skinny guy growing up, having to prove myself all the time. So I competed with a chip on my shoulder. So that was a huge part of it. I took it very, very personal. So you, you actually used it deliberately as in, yeah, maybe he's quite, he's all right as a, as a person, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to lower my guard. Did you use that to fuel your training? Yeah. I, oh my gosh. I, and, then, and at that point, I mean, Carl and I are cool now, you know, when we see him now, we talk and we laugh and, and, I, and I like him, you know, but at the time, I, I just thought he, I just made him a horrible person. Everything about him was horrible. You know, everything he did was wrong. <laughs> so I said, he, anything he did, like I said, if, if he if he walked into a room and didn't speak to me, then I was like, oh, man, so he didn't speak to me. Man, if he, if he walked in the room and spoke to me, I said, do you hear how he talked to me? You know, so whatever he did didn't matter. I was going to turn around to my benefit. And, and that's what I felt like I had to do because it's like competing against Bolt at his peak. You have to do everything you can to get that guy, you know. And, and I said, Carl lost for 10 years. And it was it got to the point where it was almost a, it was a mental thing. Most other jumpers just kind of gave it to him. And I was like, no, man, I don't get down like that. You're you're another person. You're a guy. And if, if you can beat me, I'm going to beat you. You know, and I didn't look at him that way. I said, OK, when we first started competing against each other, I knew it wasn't ready. But I got better and better and better and better. And it got to a point where I was like, OK, if you're not on your game today, I'm going to get you. But by the time we got to the world championships, I was like, I'm going to get you anyway. doesn't matter what you do. Whatever you do, I'm going to jump further. Because I just felt like, I mean, Carl was a great technician. And obviously, you know, world record holder in the, in the, in the um, 100 meters. But I felt like I was more of an athlete and a better jumper. So, um, you know, I, I looked at it that way. So I felt like I could beat him. In the 100 meters, okay, I couldn't do anything about that. But I felt like I could beat you in this long jump. So you've got this, it sounds like you had this level of confidence because you'd, you'd, you'd replicated the, the world record, albeit not by the rules of the game. Right. You, know, you, 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 just, you just failed it a, a few times. Right. You'd got mm -hmm. that massive jump um, that, that sort of reproduced that at the world championships. Right. Um, now, Carl registers an 891 illegal win so it doesn't break the world record legally but it right. leads the competition what are you now thinking you know um actually that moment is one of the moments i'm most proud of in my athletic career because carl came down to jump the furthest jump in history passing that immoral number by bob beeman and normally you expect an athlete to go, oh, well, wow. get this heart and maybe try to pick themselves back up. But at that moment, I knew, I said, okay, that's not it. I'm, I'm still going to get him. And I remember it was, it was weird because my, my coach was in the stands. And he was up in the stands a little bit. So I was always trying to get advice from him. And we we're using a lot of hand signals and stuff. And, and I walked over after the jump, I walked over to that corner of the track to, to say something to him. And it was all these thousands of people. And, and, for, and, for, and for some reason at that moment, it just got really quiet. And I yelled to him, I said, that's not gonna win it. And all the people were like, ooh. <laughs> 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 I just felt confident. I said, no, man, because the way I was jumping, I knew that my approach wasn't on, you know? And I knew if I hit my approach, I was gonna go. I knew I was gonna go past the world record. I knew that. I knew that after my second jump, the jump that you mentioned, the 854, it was really, really easy. And I was just taking it easy on that jump just to get a fair one in. That was that was 854. I was like, oh yeah. Wait till I to get my run and I start really being aggressive with this. So um, yeah, but at that moment, I thought to myself, nah, that's not gonna win it. And I said, I'm going, and I thought, I thought to myself, okay, thank you, Lord, for putting that win behind him. So it was not, it wasn't legal. So that was like my cue. If, if you're going to do it, it's time to do it now. Don't wait till the last jump, do it now. And so, um, you know, then after that, after his jump, 
he was really celebrating a lot, you know, pumping his fist. Yeah, look right at me like, yeah, that's right, that's right. And I was like, woo, man, you might as well call said something about my mom. You know, <laughs> I took it real, real personal. I felt like he was calling me out. And um, that just brought up my, my, my uh, competitive juices. So my adrenaline was really, really high. You know, um, I say I compare it to the feeling that you get, that fight or flight feeling that you get when you're like, say you're about to get into a fight and you're just like, you're just like crazy amped up and you're like, uh-oh, something's about to happen. That's the feeling I had when I stepped on the runway and I knew something big was going to happen. I was charged up and I was focused and I felt like this is your moment because I had visualized myself breaking the world record, man, for years. I mean, for, and from when I was a little kid, I, I always would pretend, imagine myself saying, okay, Mike Powell's in fourth place in the Olympic Games. He has to come back on his last jump and beat Carl Lewis to, to win the gold medal. And so I would, I would practice that stuff all the time. So the fact I did that thousands of times, the moment was right there for me. And then, you know, you talked about celebration. I practiced the celebration too. So when I ran on the track, I that's what I planned on doing. <laughs> that that's I've just got goosebumps listening to you describe that. Um, the, the the utilization of another competitor at their peak to to enable you further, um, but also every childhood dream that I've ever heard would sound a bit like what you've described where. You're, you know, you're scoring the final goal in the World Cup final or something, or you're playing that out in your right. youth. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, I suppose that, that has some use because you, you're in a position to say, well, I've done it before. You just right. have to physically do it. Did that give you a lot of confidence going into that jump? Yeah. So the, the thing is, since I had rehearsed that moment in my head so much, when the time came, I had already, it's like, if you practice something so much, when the moment comes, you just do what you, what you uh, have been practicing. So in my mind, I had practiced that thousands of times doing that at that moment. So it wasn't, it wasn't anything I shied away from. I was like, okay, now the time, this is where the rubber meets the road. Everything is, in, I'm, in, I'm in great shape. It's a fast track. I'm, it, the, the weather was perfect for me. I was fired up. I was gonna jump in against my my rival. It was the world championships. Had the world stage. Go for it, you know. And because um, that's the kind of competitor I was. Um, that's the kind of person I am too. I mean, I feel like if if like for example, if a situation, a stressful situation is going on when people are freaking out, I'm just looking for the solution. So people are gonna run around screaming. I'm be thinking, okay what has to be done right now, you know? And so I, I, I pride myself on being able to deal with stressful situations like that. Oh, that's, that's really interesting. So what I've heard from you is about fire, uh, adrenaline, um, that stoking the aggression almost, mm -hmm. which, which in many ways, I think a lot of people, when they're trying to get into a performance state, that doesn't help them because they, that causes some tension. Right. Whereas you're describing the that jump being rhythmic um, and flow and right. and and everything just sort of uh, being easy. Mm -hmm. Is the, is there anything? Because they sound like they're actually quite contradictory. You know, you, you see the you see the runners in a hundred meters and they tense up in the final, but they were faster in the semi final. That type of right. phenomenon. Was yeah. there anything that you did in the moments where you? are about to start your run up. And I know you're you and many others have sort of rocking back forward routines and various mm. shaking of hands and so on. Is there anything that you said to yourself or any any trigger that you use to enter into that right now it's go time? Well, I was really big into visualization. So, um I started working with a sports psychiatrist a psychologist rather, um, about maybe two years before the um, world championships. And um, we had developed a great relationship and, and we were talking at, at the time we were trying to 
attack my fouling problem because it felt like some of it was mental. So he would he would kind of give me you know suggestions. So I wasn't like under hypnosis, but you know, it was like, you know, in that suggestive state where I could receive things. We had, he asked me questions about what I was trying to do during my approach. And I explained to him what I was trying to do because it's like the hundred meters, there's a there's an art to running the, the, the 200 meters. You know, you have to clear the blocks, stay down low, driving out, going to your drive phase, coming up slowly, go to your maximum speed. And at the end, you're going to speed maintenance because you're not accelerating more, you're just trying to relax. So the, the, and so the rhythm is really, really important. It, like in the 100 meters, if you lose a step, that can cause you to race. So same thing, like in a long jump, if, you're miss, if you miss one step, it throws the whole rhythm off. So, what, so in my approach, what I was trying to do was drive out the back, really forcefully for, for three, three uh, cycles, which would be six steps. And then another three cycles of standing up into sprint position, another two cycles of really attacking the board. And then the last two cycles is setting up the penultimate step for the takeoff. So what my sports psychologist, what we had done, we want to make it feel really natural. So not so much like, okay, I do this now, robotic, blah, blah, blah. we want to make it more natural, mm -hmm. almost more animalistic. So what we had done, um, we, have, we found different animals to, um, to kind of signify each phase of the jump, of the approach. So the beginning part of my approach, I was trying to be strong and powerful. So I thought of myself as like a charging bull, like, you know, steam, front of the nose, everything, just a charging bull. And then the second part of my approach, I wanted to start to stand up and get into a tall sprint position. So I thought of myself as a galloping horse, grabbing the ground, pulling myself up nice and tall. And then the third phase, I want to be light on my feet, but really a, but fast though too. So I thought of myself as being like a cheetah, light on my feet, flying 70 miles an hour, you know, across the ground. And then the last part of my uh, um, takeoff with well, the approach was the takeoff. And to go far, I was an avid basketball player, you know, and I had to dump from the free throw line. Yeah, I and heard, I that, heard. And they... I can spend a, like, a pickup game, people would be freaking out. It's only, 50, it's only, you know, less than five meters away. Yeah, that's, that's easy. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so in order to do that, to dump from the free throw line, you have to go high, you have to go up and then go up, up to the basket. So what I did in my, my visualization, I was a charging bull, I was a galloping horse, I was a cheetah running across the prairie, and then I was me taking off from the free throw line going for the dunk. And on that particular day, the photographer, um, famous photographer by the name of Mike Powell, yeah. Uh, British guy, you know, and yeah. um, he, um, we are good friends. He, and so, um, cause we've done some photo shoots together. And so we are real friendly. So he had this really big camera lens and he was right in the middle of the, of the pit. And I told him, I said, Mike, I said, get right in the middle of your, of the, of the pit. Because on my, the last part of my jump, um, I go through a, a hitch kick. The last part, I really try to drive my foot up as high as I can to go for my landing. So I thought to myself, okay, you're the bull, you're the good horse, you're the cheetah, you're you dumping from the free throw line, and I'm gonna take my foot and I'm gonna try to stick it right into his camera lens. So that was what I was trying to do. So when I went to run, and then when I went back, and so before I would jump, I would always go through that visualization. And at the end of that visualization also would be, the crowd responding that was part of it the ooh because like my coach one of my coaches i had before told me why do you jump and i said why he said for the oohs because when you jump far everybody gonna go ooh <laughs> <laughs> of what my visualization was about and so when i went through my visualization before that jump it was like that was, that was it i said okay you're ready to go just go now and so my visualization was just spot on, you know, like I said, so I, and once 
like when you're doing the uh, your your approach, if you make a mistake, and your first step is going to throw it off, you know, down the road, and it's going to set you up for making other mistakes too. You can correct it, but it's not going to be what it would have been. But on that one, every step that I took was right, which led to another right thing, which led to another right thing. So the momentum of doing things correctly down the road was coming, and I was like. It was like I was running downhill, like boom, with my drilling really high, knowing that, you know, I just fouled one that was about nine meters and that run wasn't even, even on really. So um, I knew, I knew. And then once I hit the sand, the crowd let me know because it was like, ooh, I mean, 60,000 people all at once. Wow, it was crazy. I couldn't even hear myself. I was yelling. I couldn't even hear myself yelling. It was so, it was so, it was so loud. And, um, and actually on that jump, I got more height than I do, than I would normally. And, and when I landed, I would try to hit the sand and then turn my hips sideways to go past where my feet first hit because the first mark you leave in the sand where they measure from. And I was so high in the air, I was used to the timing of it. I was used to like, okay, now here's the ground. But I was so high, I was like, oh, I'm still in the air, but, but my bike are turning sideways. So if you see the video, I landed sideways. Yeah. So instead of laying my feet in front of me, my feet were over to the side. So I lost, I mean, a good 15, 20 centimeters off of the jump. So okay. it could have been, been about 915 or something like that. I landed straight. Oh, that would, well, I mean, okay, there's so much in there. And I love that imagery. I love that embodiment of uh, an animal or an action um mm -hmm. just uh, they're just so successful for athletes to simplify it right uh, as opposed to gotta lift my leg up gotta do this as you say yeah. i think robotic is a great word it almost mm -hmm. also feels like a method you've got to remember the order and the specific thing and i think for for me your classic is you know if you're a hurdler, don't hit the first hurdle. So you think don't hit the first hurdle and then you hit the first hurdle. <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> um, so yeah, I love that. But you were, you were quite, you were quite advanced then in terms of working as with a sports psychologist back in the late eighties and early nineties. Now it's, now it's common. Now right. the stigma for want of a better word has actually gone down because more and more people are familiar with it and use it. Right. And, and see it as a part of, well, if I'm gonna train my body, I'm gonna train my mind. Um, right. what, what caused you to start exploring that? Did you, did you st um, seek somebody out? Uh, my coach, my coach, Randy Huntington. Randy is a super intellectual. I mean, he's the kind of person that, okay, anything related to movement or anything, any kind of like, you know, for track or whatever, he's gonna know the answer, but he also knows pretty much anything else too. And, um, and for Randy, some people take him the wrong way because they'll think that he's arrogant. But to me, the way that he spoke, I didn't take it personally. I felt like, okay, this guy's a genius. This is how he, this is how he interacts. And I'm here to learn. So why am I trying to have an attitude? So when people, some people couldn't deal with them because they felt like they took it personal instead of just appreciating his, his brilliance. So he brought a lot of things to my, the, the scientific part to my training. Because before I started training with him, um, I, my best was like 827 or something like that. And I was number six in the world, you know, and I went to, I went to start training with him uh, in 1987, year before 1988 Olympics. And, and when we had our first meeting, he said, I've been looking at video of you and, and watching you compete. He said, we got a four year plan. You're gonna break the world record. And I was like, all right, this is the guy I need to be with. The guy believes in me and what I wanna do. He knows, he knows what I can do. So whatever he said, I did, you know? And so we were doing like, we were way ahead of the game. I was doing like pool workouts back then when people weren't even using the pool yet. That was a part of my everyday training. 
you know, and um, on my therapy, I have one of the best therapists, namely like a lady named Valerie Sinkus. Um, she was awesome using the microcurrent way back when. Now stuff is all commonplace, but I was ahead of the game. And a lot of it was because of him. He suggested I could a sports psycho psychologist, you know, because we went to cover every angle. And um, so I, I feel fortunate that I had him. He was a big, I mean, I always had to go out there and jump, but it was a collaboration between the two of us because um, he had the knowledge and, and I, was, I was a willing participant, you know, so we had a great relationship and we still do. He's an awesome coach. He's, he's one of the best. He's one of the best out there. And, um, you know, things happen for a reason. And so we crossed paths when we did. And I'm so thankful for that. I feel like I would have broken the world record but that was the that was my vehicle right there to make it happen. So you know, and like I know that I'm not the only one that could have broken the record. I'm just the one who did. There have been people out there who had the talent to. Obviously, Carl Lewis, you know, but um, guys like Larry Myricks and Yvonne Bedroso, Dwight Phillips, Saladino, you know. There's the young guys now, Echeverria. Yeah. And, and, and Gail, the talent is there, but you got to do it at that moment when it counts. That's hard. I mean, because I tell people, I say, look, hey, it was, it, was, it was hard for me, but it's harder for other people because I had to do that just to win the competition. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't just... That's how good he was. I had to break an unbreakable world record just to have a chance to beat that guy. And even when I did break the world record, I fully expected him to break it on the next jump. Yeah, I was okay. surprised that he didn't. Because that's the first time I thought, you know what? Well, that might hold up. I might really win this thing. I thought for sure his next jump, he was going to go like 9-10. And then I thought, okay, then I'm going to have to go 9-15. And then I hope he doesn't go 920. See, that's that really fun. interesting. So you you were almost anticipating having to 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 go up and up. Um oh, yeah. and that that speaks to your raw competitiveness of that was great, celebrate, 200 meters, bounce about, but then okay, we're still in the competition and I might still have to produce again. Well, I had a little bit of help because when I broke the world record, I was so happy. I was running around. I just forgot about what was going about the meet. I was just celebrating. And, and one of my, my, my good friends is a long jumper from, um, from Australia. His name is David um, Colbert. Sorry. David, but he said Covet, but it's Colbert. <laughs> but um, I was running around, and David came and said, Mike. I was like, what? I thought he coming over to give me some dap. Goes, Carl's got two jumps left. And I was like, oh, crap. That's right. That's Carl over there. And the thing is, it wasn't very hard for me to imagine that because that's what Carl always did. He always came back. When somebody put a big jump, he always came back. And, he, and I saw it. He did it against me and other people for 10 years straight. Didn't lose. You know what I'm saying? So my thought was, okay, I know he'll get this one, but I'm going to have to do the next one, and then I hope he doesn't give me the last one. That wasn't a stretch. That's what I thought was going to happen fascinating that's really interesting so you've 895 won the competition can i what well, you've mentioned re-watching the the performance right digesting it soaking it up potentially as as um understanding so that you can replicate that um right can i ask you what it was like experiencing that peak but I mean, you went on to win, to um, win the world championships again. But what was it? What was it like, kind of going to that peak? But you know, that's it. That's your that's your moment. Um, reliving it sounds like a part of processing it. How right. were you after that big moment? In some ways, it was a letdown. In some ways, not because you know um, everything's connected. So when I did that jump, it wasn't just about me jumping; it was about every disappointment I had in my life, everybody who ever doubted me, 
I said, any, any girl turn me down for a date, anything. It was to me to show the world, like, I'm here, respect me. You know, so it was a very personal thing. It, and it was kind of like the jump was more than just the jump. It was a, it was my stamp, you know, to, to declare that I'm worthy, you know. And um, I remember that night after the competition, um, you know, I just like to go out and have a good time, party and stuff. I mean, grab some beers and stuff, hang out. But at that night, because my friends asked me, what'd you do? I said, man, I went back to my hotel room. And I was in the lobby with my coach and my, and my, and my therapist and a few other people. And I had like a beer and a half. And I was just kind of sitting there. And I was like, all right, I'm going to bed. <laughs> mm. You know, and um, and then and then I tried to go to sleep, and then about three in the morning, my phone started ringing um, from calls from all over the world. You know, from the, especially the press back in the United States and everything. So I was on the phone the rest of the night, and then the next day, um, I went to the uh, I had a, a press conference, and I was, so I was waiting for the press conference to start. So I was in the main press center. And they, you know, that's where there was more newspapers and stuff back then. And they had, they showed me all the front pages of all the newspapers, the big newspapers across the world. And I was on the front page, you know, not, not the sports section, front page, you know, of, of in, in London, in Australia, you know, in United States, all over. And I saved a lot of those. You know, and I realized, oh, wow, this is a big deal thing I just did. You know, there was a lot of things I broke down there, you know, because it was not only breaking the world record, it was beating Carl. And it was it, it was it was perfect for me because it was the underdog and I was comfortable in that role. And and so, you know, I, I like I'm very proud of that now because I talk to not only jumpers, but just other athletes. And they tell me, man, that made me want to do the long jump or that really made me want to compete in track and field that moment. Because it was one of those moments where if you believe and you work hard, you can accomplish anything. And that was the epitome of what I did. You know, so I'm really proud of that because, you know, a betting man would have bet against me. And, and, and rightfully so, unless you knew me. And you knew how my training was going because leading up to the competition, my training was like, it was crazy. I knew something big was going to happen. And my last competition, my last training session before I broke the world record, um, I used to do a little uh, short approach jump just from six strides. And my best was um, like from six steps was like seven meters 10 or something like that, seven meters, 20. And then on that jump, I went like 780 on my last jump, you know? So I improved, I, I improved like by six centimeters. Wow. Six steps. And I was like, Ooh, I'm ready. That would get you in most Olympic finals these days. <laughs> oh my gosh. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and so my, so I know, I felt like, okay, this is the time. I can't, I, I tell people, I came to Tokyo to break the world record. There was no doubt about that. That's what it was all about. It was leading up to that. From the time he beat me at the national championships, I was like, okay, next time I'm gonna get on breaking the world record. And, um, and, in, and another funny thing, this, what actually happened was that that was my last jump session. And after that jump session, we went to a, a, a weight room where they had Kaiser equipment, which is the equipment that um, that Randy Huntington helped design, and, I, and that's what I trained on. So I did my training session, and the guy asked me to sign, you know, the, um, the board, and I wrote, you know, Mike Powell, you know, um, PB eight sixty six, which was my legal PB, even though I jumped eight seventy something when dated, and then I put nineteen ninety one WC for World Championships. 
You wrote that on the on the weight machine. I wrote that on the wall. On the wall. On the wall of this place. So you had a and then proper, I you you had precision in the in your predictions there. <laughs> it's, it's the imagery. I dreamt about it, and but that's the number they came up, and I forgot about it. And then in a couple of days later, they showed it. They showed an article in the paper, and the guy's like, "He wrote it down." <laughs> And that was the proof. And I was like, that's right. I did say that. And the funny thing is, you know, I, I'm just a stupid American. I didn't even know the metric system. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, you're a 28, one, 11 and three quarters or something, isn't it? I think the 895 was further than 890. So actually, when I did the 895 jump, I was like running around like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I came back and I was sitting there with Mark and said, how far is that? <laughs> I said, is that? Five and a half or four? What is it? And so he's like, so we tried to figure it out. Well, I said, oh, okay, it's four and a half. So I didn't even know. So for me to say that number in, in meters and not even know what it was and then actually do it, hmm. that's what I kind of felt like it was meant to be. That's amazing. I love that. Um, so what was the what was going on in the hotel room then, um, or the hotel lobby? What was going on there, uh, where you're? You just, oh, I just need to sleep. What happened? What What was the feeling you had post competition? It was such an emotional drain, you know, that it just it everything it just kind of hit me, and I was like, oh, I didn't have any energy left. It was, you know, because. It was a physical thing, but you know, the emotion and the adrenaline was so much and so high. By the time I sat down, I was just spent, you know? And after that, even after that, I went to go compete in, in Europe about a week and a half later, two weeks later, and I jumped like crap. I jumped like <laughs> eight, 17. And then I was like, and then I had like, <laughs> three more meets so up. I was like, dude, I'm done for this year. That's not. The tank is on empty. I'm I'm through. <laughs> I bet the meat. I bet the meat directors were like, "Hang on a minute, eight yeah. seventeen. <laughs> oh, yeah. they were they were um, they were kind of upset. Good story behind that though. The first competition. Well, look at this. My first time over in Europe. I I, I went over there in 1985, and um, I was going to uh, to Zurich. And I got to Zurich and everybody, I was like a new, I was a puppy, like, okay, just following everybody. What do I do? Okay, stand in line over there and get your stuff. So I came up, I'm in the line, I go up there and I, okay, Mike Powell for long jump. And then the guy looked in there and said, there's no long jump here, next. And I was like, oh, wow. So I didn't have a room. I wasn't in the meet. And that, so I was like, what happened? The thing at, at that time, Carl Lewis's manager, Joe Douglas was doing my meets. So it started to sabotage long before. Oh, that's and when so, the fuel started. That's when the demonization yeah. occurred, yeah? Yeah, he was, they knew, they knew that I was coming. And then, so, and he was doing my meet. So the next meet was Berlin. And I was like, okay, there's a long jump there. I'm in the meet and I'm getting $800. Yeah, I'm rich. <laughs> I'm a college student, you know. So I'm thinking, man, this is awesome. Now I'm gonna get eight hundred dollars. And so, um, and then when I went to the competition. Carl Lewis wasn't jumping, but he was sitting there on the board. He was sitting at the board on the track what? on the long jump board. Yeah, in a chair. And I'm like, I'm like, what's Carl doing down there? And so he was there to check me out, you know, and I jumped like crap. I jumped like 740 or something like that. Something horrible. I wasn't used to traveling. And when I, that stuff that happened in Zurich, I, I like lost like 10 pounds in like two days and I was all stressed out. And after the competition, I went to get my, like, well, at least I get my hair and dollars. And then I went, and I went to get my money from Joe and Joe was like, well, the meat promoter said he's not going to pay you 800. He's only going to pay you 300. I'm like, what are you talking about? That's, I'm supposed to get that regardless of how I competed. And I'm thinking to myself, 
wait a minute, man, you're Joe Douglas. You have, you're the strongest agent out here. You got car You going to tell me they're going to try to tell you, you can't pay me $500, $800. I'm like, man, this is crap, dude. So I don't know what was going on with that. Maybe it was, maybe it was a coincidence, but to me, like, come on, dude, that was crazy. So the good thing about that is that um, after I broke the world record, the first meet after I broke the world record was in Berlin, the same place he didn't want to pay me for, let me see, six years earlier. And I told my agent about that. I said, oh, we're going to get him. We want to get them. So at the time, before then, um, my parents was was pretty good. It was about twelve thousand dollars in me. And people, and I was like trying. I said after I broke the world record, I was like, I'm thinking, man, how much am I gonna get paid now? You know, twenty five, thirty thousand, something like that. And my agent was like, well, regardless of that, we're gonna get him. He, so we said, okay, we're gonna do a two year deal for sixty thousand each one. And um, and the thing is, the meat promoter, he didn't remember. His name was Rudy Teal. He didn't remember what he did to me, but I did. And I'm like, ah, karma. <laughs> <laughs> 60,000 and that 500, please. <laughs> that was missing. <laughs> oh, that would be classic. I wish I would have said that. <laughs> you just a little top up, please. Yeah, just want my money back. Um, so, look, I mean... How did you, how did you keep that hunger? Then you said you deflated. What after? What afterwards? Did you were you able to kind of refocus, realign your goals, focus again? Yeah. yeah. Well, next, next it was, next it was to win the gold medal, and to go well for United States purposes, thirty feet. It's about nine, fifth, nine meters, fifteen. So that was my goal the next year, and I went to the training. And my training was at a higher level. And my first competition, I went 890. You know, but I heard I, at that meet, though, I, I, I did the 890. The next jump, I jumped. It was a foul. And it was 9 meters 15. They measured it. But it was really close. So the, they were waiting to see how far I was. And they measured it before they called it a foul. So they told me it was 915. But where I jumped, they didn't dig up the sand well enough. So the sand was compacted. So I um, compacted my... Uh, my vertebrae, uh, L4 and L5. And so from that point, the rest of my career, I had injuries, you know, so, um, and even yet still, I went on to jump 899 that summer, I had a great, you know, uh, summer, except for the Olympics, you know, I jumped 864 and, and didn't win the gold. But my goals were big. My goal was to, after I broke the world record, I'm going to come back next year, win the gold medal, jump 30 feet, then start running the 200 meters. And then in 1996, I went to do the decathlon and break the world record, score 9,000 points and retire. So to me, goals, yeah. <laughs> even my goals, well, I got one of them, but to me, even the world record, 895, ah, it should be at least around 915, 920. That's where it should have been. Isn't that just the competitor in you though? Every champion I've ever spoken to, they always see the potential for, uh, a greater advantage or I could have spotted that as you've just dissected your long jump performance the opportunities they're always looking for what can add value and uh, it's never quite good enough that perfectionism aspect it's always there though isn't it yeah and yeah it's true I mean because I think it's um it's beneficial in a way because it keeps me humble I don't I don't look at myself I mean because when I did break the world record, it was difficult for me because I went from not obscurity. I mean, some people would know who I was. I wasn't even like, you know, whatever. But when I did that, a lot of people knew who I was. And so I was used to going around the United States, like, you know, oh, nobody knows me here. And I remember I was, when I got back, I, I bought a new car, bought a convertible Saab. And I was like, yeah, man. And uh, so I'm driving on the freeway and then this truck was next to me. He's like, ah, ah. I looked over, he goes, Mike Powell. I'm like, yeah, like, whoa, okay. <laughs> it's different. 
And um, it's so funny, later on, on that drive, I'm driving to LA, cop pulls me over for speeding, which I was. <laughs> so, I'm just like, oh man, maybe he's gotta give me a warning or something. And he's writing up the ticket and he's looking down, he goes, you're my pal. I'm like, yeah. He goes, man, why didn't you tell me? I would have let you out. I was like, man, I, I can't assume that. I don't know, yeah. you might be a Wolves fan or something. Give me- <laughs> <laughs> how's that conversation gonna go no I, 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 I don't want a ticket because don't you know how far i can jump into a sand pit <laughs> yeah so my life it changed a lot and um and actually i had i had developed um anxiety um and uh i i i i take medication for that still um, because it was so hard for me to deal with just being in the public's eye. And I was like, I was a very, you know, extroverted person. And so um, knowing that it was like not, even, not, not even so much that people would recognize me, but like not knowing. Am I going to walk into a room and somebody like, hey, you're my pal? Or am I going to like, nobody's going to know. So I'm wondering, like, when, okay, are, are people going to respond to me? You know, so it took a long time to adjust to that. And it was difficult, you know. So I was, I was, I started to have anxiety problem. I had a panic, a couple of panic attacks, and um, so it was hard. That was one of the downsides of it, you know, because um, it's 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 difficult. Now I understand why, like celebrities and stuff, hang around other celebrities because they they'll know they'll be treated like normal, you know. Um, so. Um, that's you know, interesting though. When I go, if I if I go to a competition or something, or somebody recognizes me and and they'll be like, Can you can you sign this for me? And they'll be shaking. And I'm like, dude, if you knew how goofy I was, you would not be shaking right now. I'm like the biggest goofball in the world. I'm just Mike, man. I jumped far in some sand. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Thank you for appreciating what I've done. And I and I'm appreciative of it also. But like I said, I'm also humble about it too, annoying that, you know, I was just, I was really blessed to have done what I did in that situation. And um, I'm just, I just can't believe it's been 30 years. It's still here. So just, just last couple of questions there. If I could pick up on that, Mike, that you've said, you know, I'm worthy now. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, You were worthy before. Uh, you just needed the recognition. You needed some numbers to uh, verify that. What do you tell athletes now? What sort of what sort of coaching points do you share with them uh, right. now with the wisdom of time of what you've experienced? Um, well, I do a lot of motivational speaking. And um, the, the thing that I emphasize to people is that if you want to be have success in something, there's four things that you have to do. You have to set a goal and a realistic goal, a realistic goal to you. It may be far-fetched to somebody else, but I think like if you can see yourself doing something, that means you can do it. And then you have to have a plan, a great plan. And for me, that was getting the best coach, having the best training partners, having the best agent, having the best travel, you know, uh, travel person you know, the best therapist, everything. And then the obvious thing is to put in hard work because everybody's going to work hard. How hard are you willing to work to get there? And then the fourth and most important thing is to believe in yourself because people are going to put you down and doubt you and you'll doubt yourself. But you have to find it within yourself to believe in yourself no matter what happens. That was the hard, that's the hardest part because people can do things, but they, they'll take themselves out of it. So, um, you know, to accomplish something, anything really, you, and you might get lucky, but and luck is a part of it, you know? If you're lucky because you're, you're in a position to be lucky. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, so I, my main message is that you have to believe in yourself and just really look at how you're trying to accomplish something and, and don't be afraid to shoot for the stars. If you feel like you can be a world record holder and you really believe that, then go for that. Mm. You know, 
And it's like, when I was telling people I was gonna break the world record, they were looking at me down, I was crazy when I first started saying it. And reporters and stuff were looking at me like, oh yeah, right. Well, you know, if anybody can do it, it's gonna be Carl. I'm like, all right, watch. In two years from now, you come try to shake my hand, okay? Remember, remember this. So there's a lot of people out there who remember that too, because I was saying it, I wasn't quiet about it, I was talking it. I said, I'm breaking the world record, you know? So a lot of people didn't know, but I was talking it for years. You know, so it's just like, you know, you. I just believe that if if you you speak it into existence. Hmm. Love that. So four things, having a goal that's realistic, a plan uh, of action, put in the work and believe in yourself. Those four four little nuggets there. It's yeah. I, I was I was half hoping that you'd say, whatever you do, start like a charging ball, then a galloping horse. <laughs> Then a, then a cheetah, and then just reach for a dunk and kick, kick a camera lens in the end. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, the thing is, I, I, just, this, I was talking to this woman the other day, and she, she was saying, I'm weird. I'm weird. I'm sorry. I'm like, don't be sorry. It's good to be weird. Who wants to be like everybody else? So I, if it's, I am sorry to people, think outside the box. Do something different. Think differently. Don't go like the, the way that everybody wants to go. Go the way you think you should go. You know, so um, that's part of it too. Because like I said, when I was working, when Randy was, was coaching me, we were doing things nobody else was doing. But I was completely with, I'm like, oh, this is, this is awesome. I love this. This is the science of it. I mean, he used to have conversations with other like really technical coaches they would talk so far over my head. I'm like, hello, English, please. <laughs> the, the term they're using was like, <laughs> over my head. so I laugh now because sometimes I'll start using that terminology and I'm after looking at like, okay, sorry, uh, lift your knee. <laughs> you know, keep it simple. <laughs> <laughs> like, but, like, yeah, like you know, the physio, have... go on. No, you go. Well, I was just going to say like the physiotherapist, when I tell them that, that, that I've got a pain at the front of my knee and they say, oh, you've got anterior knee pain. I say, hang on a minute. I've just told you that. And you've just replaced front of knee with anterior. <laughs> <laughs> Try to make yourself sound better. Yeah. <laughs> Did I get into it now, even with like some uh, biomechanists and they'll be like saying, oh, well, Mike did this and did this and did this and did this. I'm like, okay. What you're saying is fine and, and, and good, but it's theory. I was a bull. I was a charging horse. I was a, a, a cheetah. I was me dunking from the free throw line. That's what I did. All you're doing is reporting on what you saw. So give credence to that. It's not all about just the science of it. It's a combination of the two. And if I say, I say, otherwise, if your science is so good, then you go do it. Let me see. I, I coach, but I don't have the top jumpers coming to me. And I'm like, what's wrong with you guys? Did you think I just fell out of bed? Oops, I broke the world record. You know, and it's mm. like, and I've had it for this long. I'm like, okay, well, no one wants to come find out. Then I'll just continue being the world record holder. But they'd rather go to these coaches who've never been out there. They don't know what it feels like to fly through the air, you know, going 40 kilometers an hour, you know, and having the land. They don't know what that feels like. They don't know what it tastes like, you know? So that's why I'm, cause when I was, when I was competing, I had a cheat sheet. Cause I got a chance to watch Carl Lewis and Larry Marks, all a host of Robert Emian, a host of great jumpers. And I was learning everything. And I'll ask them questions and copy stuff and everything else. And these young guys, now they come to me. The first thing they say is, I'm going to break your record. And I'm like, okay, how? Tell me, how are you going to do it? And they look at me like, oh, I'm like, tell me, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? What's your plan to break in my world record? It's, and so there you go. You've got, somebody's got a goal, but they haven't got a plan. You, well, they've, they're missing, do they do the work and have they got belief? They might have belief in a goal, but the, the, without the middle bit about, around your four, uh, your four key points, plan and work. Um, mm -hmm. Are they prepared to do that? Exactly. And like I said, for, for me, it was a little bit easier because I had a rabbit in front of me. I had Carl out there to go chase. So my now, I mean, there's been a lot of, there's been some good jumping so far this year, though. Yeah. You know, the guy from Greece, you know, jumping 860. 
And, um, you know, there's been, there's been, you know, a couple guys jumped in me, Echeverria has been jumping well already. So it looks like there's going to be, it's going to be a good competition at the Olympics. But think about for me, I had Carl. Carl was a guarantee A70 every mm -hmm. time, let alone when he went, you know, 891. Are those guys going to have that? I doubt it. I but you never know, though. I said, what well, one man can do, another can do. I did it, so I mean someone else can do it. It's a matter of time. Yeah, I, I guess it will be. And, you know, some, some events are hot at the moment, like pole vaulting, middle distance. It's, you know, there's some events just seem to bubble at the right at a certain time. It it seems like long, long jump has hasn't necessarily in that same way of that, that rivalry that you had with Carl that, that, that I suppose created or amplified the moment. Because when a world record gets set, it's, it's so rarely a, alongside somebody else. It's normally right. just ignites for one person, but it just seemed to amplify that moment that you you're able to perform, which is just for just phenomenal. Well, you know, the thing is the world record history of the world record in the long jump is yeah. there's only been like let me see in the last hundred years, there's only been like about well, not hundred. There's there was a couple guys that were had the world record like in the twenties, but from the time Jesse Owen broke the world record, he had it for 25 years. Then Ralph Boston and Igor Terevanish went back and forth with the world record for about like about six or seven years. And then Bob Beeman had for 23 and I've had it for 30. So this is one of those kind of records that that, that stand, you know, and um, it's it's not easy. It's not easy, that's a long way. I mean, when I look at it now, I'm like, whoa, I'm like, I did that, like, hey, I look good. <laughs> I'm, so pl I'm so pleased that you have that reaction as well. Um, oh, I, I did it, I, I measured it out an Lord. event um, last week. I, I do that every time um, to, to introduce people to high performance thinking. And people will just go, what? And I just quipped. I said, you know, during the pandemic, that's that's a good day out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the thing is, it looks far out on the track, but when you look at it like inside, you know, because when my, when my agent did uh, for promotional stuff after I broke the world record, he sent out my card attached to it was a ribbon that was 895 oh, and brilliant. told them take this and put it out in the hallway and stretch it out so you can see everybody their business can see how far it is and people are like no and so whenever i do my 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 my, my speeches or appearances or whatever i put the distance out there so most times like I'm, I'm sometimes i'll be in a room and it's bigger than the room it's bigger than the room yeah or if i'm on stage it'll be bigger than the stage <laughs> and I put a cone out there, put it over there, and then and then while I'm talking, they're just looking, going like, no way. <laughs> that guy flew. I'm like, yep, I did. It was a low, yeah. low orbit flight. <laughs> yeah. Look, Mike, I'm so appreciative of this conversation. Um, I've admired you throughout your career. Uh, to hear the energy and the, uh, the, the style that I've seen you perform with has just been phenomenal. It's so, it was so captivating to watch it. It, um, it, it, didn't, it didn't propel me to want to be a long jumper, but it propelled me to want to study, uh, study the science of sport and to help performers jump, row, uh, leg it around, and splash about uh, just a little bit better than they could do. And um, to hear you speak about the event but also the humility that you've got and how open you are. Um, it's been really special. So thank you so much. Thank you. you know, and I'm, thank you for saying that. And, you know, the thing is, I get a, a, a joy out of it now because when I look at it now, it's like it's not even me. I'm looking at that competition. So I'm just like, I feel really blessed that I was a part of that because it was me and Carl, the whole situation. And I'm just, I'm thankful that I was able to produce or be a part of one of the greatest moments in, 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 in track and field history. Yeah, it, it's, it, it, stand, it stands up there. I mean, people have great performances, like his Ozzy Bolt and stuff like that. But to have two people going back and forth like that, like a championship fight, it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. <laughs> no, th that's exactly my reflection. I was there in the Sydney stadium watching Kathy Freeman. Um, uh. And... 
you could say she was she was competing against a culture you know she, right. there was that that level of pressure um watching radisha perform um you know these sorts of moments that you there, there was something special about the performance but this had that co and overt feel to it that rivalry yeah. that fierceness yeah. and Definitely. and it was so it was so palpable to watch uh yeah. it's just phenomenal oh mike brilliant thank you so much amazing right. thank you